As you watch this teaching, please subscribe, like, and comment so more people can see it. Welcome to Home Group. My name is Rick Renner, and Denise and I are so glad that you're with us tonight. But hey, this week we're talking about foundations of faith and the power of the Word of God. So we want you to get our free download, which is called Foundations of Faith, what you need to know to become a mature believer. It's 10 lessons and it's free. Friend, it's free. I'm not asking you to spend money. It's free for the download. Just go to renner.org. You can download it right now. And while you're there, if you want to buy the whole series, the whole series, 10 parts, it comes in all kinds of formats. It's without Denise. It's without our guys, just me teaching verse by verse. It is loaded. And I know it'll be a blessing to you. And we're also offering you this week, our book called 10 guidelines to help you achieve your long awaited promotion. But tonight we're going to go to James chapter one, Denise. We haven't been there yet. I love it. But open your Bibles to James chapter one, wonderful verses. Mm. And in James chapter one, tonight we're going to begin in verse 21, where James says, wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. Well, this week we've been talking about foundations of faith, knowing the Bible, graduating from one level up into the next level, really receiving the word of God into your life. And in this verse, James tells us what we need to do to receive the engrafted word. And the first thing he tells us is there are some things we need to lay aside. Wow. Mm -hmm. Lay aside, Denise in Greek, is apotithemi. The word apo means away, but the way that it's used in this verse, mm -hmm. it carries the idea of distance, disconnection, separation, putting space between you and something else. Oh, that's good. So this is not accidental. You're very intentionally saying, I'm pushing that so far away mm -hmm. from me that there's space between me and that thing. Yes. But the second part of the word is tithemi, which means to lay something down. Well, when you compound the two words together, lay aside, really means to take off, lay down, and push away. In fact, you've pushed it beyond your reach mm. so that you cannot reach over and easily pick it back up and put it back on again. And this word lay aside in Greek is the same word which was used to depict the process of taking your clothes off at the end of the day. Let me use my clothes. Let's say it's the end of the day. So here we are having home group with you. After home group, we go home and I want to put on my robe. Well, how am I going to put on my robe? Am I going to stand in front of the mirror and say, okay, jacket, I'm through with you. Come off. Is it going to magically come off of me? No. Wait, what, what about this shirt? This shirt has buttons. How's this shirt going to come off of me? Apotithemy. I have to use my fingers to remove my jacket and the shirt does not magically come off, I have to individually push every single button through the buttonhole, which means if I'm gonna shed these clothes, I have to be very deliberate and very intentional. That's what this word means, which means if you're gonna make a break with some bad things in your life, just acknowledging that you have some bad things is not gonna change anything. That's as foolish as a person who says, I'm done with my clothes, Okay, clothes come off. They're not going to come off unless you get your fingers involved. And likewise, if you're going to make a break with what the Bible calls superfluity of naughtiness, I'm going to explain that to you in just a moment. You have to be very intentional that you're going to remove some things. You're going to use your head. You're going to use your will. You're going to use the power of the Holy Spirit and button by button, you're going to begin to remove some things from your life. It might be wrong eating. It might be wrong thinking. There's all kinds of things, but those things are not going to come off unless you are intentional to remove them and not just remove them, but oppo put so much space between you and those things that you can't reach over to retrieve them again. You know, Rick, there's some things that the Holy Spirit has dealt with me about through the years, and it is truly apotithemy. Mm -hmm. it, it is, I mean, he has so talked to me about those things, and he will not let me touch those things. Well, that's good. 
and they are separate from me. And when I gravitate to those things, the Holy Spirit, he deals with me and I stay free. But it's because of the Holy Spirit and it's because agreeing with the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And I know that the Holy Spirit, he's working in your life. And when when you I just want to encourage you that when you hear him say, I've already spoken to you about that. I've already spoken to you about that unforgiveness. Don't get that back in your life again. Then our part is to agree with the Holy Spirit and ask him for his help because he wants to keep us in that place of freedom. Well, and I think one thing that helps us get free is when we understand how filthy are our bad attitudes. Oh, that's so good. And that's what the next thing says. It says, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. One reason that Christians don't change is because they convince themselves, well, it's bad, but it's not that bad. That's just what you think. This verse says, if you're out of the will of God, thinking bad thoughts, doing bad things, eating what you shouldn't eat, violating your conscience, it is filthy. The word filthiness is the Greek word ruparion, and listen to what it describes. It describes something obnoxiously filthy something vile or soiled, something that is extremely base, and it was the very word used to describe filthy, smelly, stinking clothes. In fact, if you read James chapter 2, it says, if a man come into your assembly wearing vile clothes, it's the same word. It pictures a man whose elbows are covered with dirt and his clothes are stinking. You know, years ago when Denise and I pastored a little church that we were never supposed to pastor. We had a man, actually we had two men, who came to our church and they just stank terrible, didn't they, Denise? They just stank terrible. One of them worked in a slaughterhouse Mm -hmm. where they killed chickens. Mm -hmm. And he came to church in those clothes and he never changed his clothes day after day after day. You would walk into place, everybody knew he had arrived because you could smell him, but he couldn't smell himself. Isn't that amazing? We could all smell him, but he had lived in that stink for so long that he became dead to how obnoxious he was. Well, that's what happens to us. We tolerate something so long that we become kind of numb to how bad it is. But other people know when you got a bad attitude. We bring God can smell it. We bring a smell. Well, either we bring the smell of death, or the Bible says the fragrance Fragrance of Christ. Fragrance of life. We carry fragrances. Every place we go. And this verse goes on to say, filthiness, that which is filthy, stinking, were to lay it apart and superfluity of naughtiness. Superfluity is the Greek word parasos. It's an old word. It describes something that exists in abundance, like a river that swells out of its banks and floods everything. Now let me give you an illustration. When I was a kid, my grandfather Miller lived in a house next to a lake called Dead Man's Lake near Skyatook, Oklahoma, and his lake was fed by a filthy, dirty creek called Bird Creek. And sometimes every year, Bird Creek would swell, it would flood into Dead Man's Lake, and between Dead Man's Lake and Bird Creek, they would get so full, here it is translated as the word superfluity, the word parasos, that all that mud, It wasn't just mud, it was red. It was from red clay. It would come out of the banks. It would flood everything. It would go into their house. One year it was so deep in their house, it destroyed their grand piano. They kept the piano for years, but it never worked. It was rusted. They just put photos on top of it. It was awful. And my daddy and I would get in the boat, and the highway that we normally would drive down we would ride down in our boat, turn, go out to their property, and there would be Grandpap and Joe standing on the front porch waiting for us to come get them. And when the waters finally would begin to recede, guess what it looked like? It looked like everything had been slimed. Just slimed. It was awful, disgusting. Well, this verse is saying, if you've got something filthy going on in your life, maybe you don't realize it because you've acclimated to your smell. You've acclimated to your attitude. But if you don't get a grip on it, what starts as small 
it begins to seep out. And your attitude will begin to affect your surroundings. For example, a man with a bad attitude, he can affect his kids. He's got a bad attitude about church, it'll affect his kids. His kids will pick up on that. They'll never go back to church again. What you are affects those that are around you. Well, I want to say something to women because we women, Proverbs chapter 14, verse 1 says that a woman, a wise woman, she builds up her house. So you see, it's her responsibility. That part of building up the house is on the woman. But a foolish woman, she has power too. She tears down her house. So if we as women, ladies, I'm talking to you, if we carry stinky, ugly attitudes into our families, into our children, with our husbands, then that's what we carry. We're carrying that into the house. We're, we, with our attitude, are either building up our house or we are tearing it down. And, of course, I know none of you listening to me right now want to be those that tear down our house. But it has to do with our attitude. But this verse says superfluity of overflowing naughtiness. If you don't get a grip on it... Mm -hmm. It will become abounding, overflowing, naughtiness. Naughtiness, the Greek word kakia. It describes something that is putrid, something rank, something just obnoxious. Isn't that amazing? Now, I want to tell you something, Denise. We each carry a smell. I carry a smell. You carry a smell. You carry a smell. Spiritually, we do. 2 Corinthians Chapter 1 says we either carry the smell of death or we carry the smell of life. But there's something else. Your friends and your neighbors and your family and God are not the only ones that smell you. Jesus called Satan Beelzebub from Beelzebub, which meant Lord of the flies. Lord of the flies. Well, have you ever noticed that when there's a pile of cow manure or some kind of a manure... What do you find around that manure? Flies. It attracts flies, doesn't it? And I personally believe that when a Christian has a bad attitude and knows that he has a bad attitude, but he's willing to sit there in that pile of manure in his head and in his mouth and in his attitude, demons begin to pick up on that. I believe that with all my heart. And it attracts demonic activity, which takes just an attitudinal problem and turns it into a stronghold, turns it into something really severe. Re relational problems. So better to get a grip on it while it's yours to deal with before you attract a bunch of demonic activity because you refuse to deal with it. This is really very serious. Mm -hmm. But hey, then it goes on to say that we are to put all these things aside and to receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. Well, the soul is the problem. The word save here does not really refer to eternal salvation. He's talking to saved people. They don't need to be saved. They are saved. This word save here, a form of the Greek word sozo, means to deliver. The word soul, the word suke, describes the mind, the will, and the emotions. Well, that's where all of our problems are. Your problems are not in your body. Your problems are not in your spirit. Your spirit's where the Holy Spirit lives. Your spirit's great. Your body doesn't have a mind of its own. Your brain makes all the decisions. If you're overeating, you can't blame it on your body. It's your mind. If you're talking wrong, you can't blame it on your mouth. It's your mind. Everything starts in the mind. The mind is where we need to be fixed. So we need our heads to be saved. We need our heads to be delivered. I call it delivered brains. That's really what this verse is talking about. Well, if you have a bad attitude and it's really stinky and it's starting to affect others, how do you deliver your head so that you think different and you act different? Well, look what the verse says. Receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. The word engrafted, the Greek word emphutas. It really means the subsequently planted. It is the same word to be transplanted. Now, let me give you an illustration. If a person, for example has a kidney failure. He can't live without a kidney. So he goes to the hospital 
and the doctors perform a surgery to save that person. In order for his life to be prolonged, he needs a new kidney. So someone donates a kidney and the kidney is planted in him. That new kidney has the power to save him. It has the power to prolong his life. He can't even live without that kidney. If he doesn't have that kidney that's just been transplanted in him, he won't be living very long. It has the power to save him. But any doctor can tell you that when a transplant patient receives a new organ, what does the body immediately try to do? Tries to reject it. Tries to reject it. And the only way a transplant patient is going to receive a new organ is if he makes the serious decision to receive medication, to listen to the doctor, and to follow the doctor's rules and advice on all the medication that is needed to keep that organ. Now, if he says, I don't want to take all of that, he's probably going to die because his body will reject it. All of that is in this, which means the Word of God has the power to save your head. It really does. It can transform the way that you think. But it may not feel natural to you. It may be such a totally different way of thinking. For example, Denise talks a lot about forgiveness. God speaks to you about the need to forgive. You know that is the Word of God. Jesus teaches it very clearly. But when it comes in you, you might say, this doesn't feel right. I don't know how to do this. I've never forgiven. And you'll try to reject the very thing that has the power to save you. Or someone who's physically sick. They learn what the Bible says about physical healing. And they try to receive that Word, but it doesn't take real quickly and it just seems like it's so uncomfortable trying to believe and so they reject it. If you don't receive it, you're going to die. But for you to receive any word from God, this verse says you have to receive it with meekness. meekness. And the word meekness is the Greek word prautes. Now people think that meekness is somebody who is weak or somebody who is quiet. doesn't mean that at all. <laughs> In fact, the word Prautes, translated meekness, describes a very strong-willed person mm -hmm. who has intentionally decided, mm -hmm. I'm going to think what somebody else thinks. Even though I don't like it, they're over me. I'm under them, so I'm going to do what they say. I'm going to think what they tell me to think. It is a strong-willed person who intentionally lays aside his own will to adapt to the will of someone else. Well, that's the way it happens. If you want the Word of God, which has the power of God to totally transform you, to do its work in you, then you have to say, flesh, shut up. Brain, shut up. You've been thinking this way a long time. It's gotten you nowhere. You're 100 pounds overweight. You haven't gotten the victory yet. It's time for you to shut up and quit talking to yourself. And you need to hear the Word of God, receive the Word of God, receive it so that it becomes engrafted in you and it begins to release its power to save you, to deliver you, to heal you. But it is a choice. I'm going to take God's Word above all. It's what I'm going to think. It's what I'm going to receive. And... Just like a transplant patient has to have medication to receive it and to keep it, you need word, you need prayer, you need fellowship, you need everything you can to undergird you as you let that word become engrafted inside you. Now I want to give you five steps. Five steps, Denise, are you ready? Mm -hmm. To help the engrafted word that will save you come into you. Are you ready? I made it real easy. Listen to this. Number one, submission. You have to be submitted to the authority of God. You have to purposely choose to come under His authority, believe what He says in His Word, then do it regardless of what you think or feel. Number one, submission. Number two, elimination. Wow, this is a big one. You must eliminate your own opinion. <laughs> this is hard to do, but it's what you got to do. 
You have to eliminate your feelings and anything else that would distract you or keep you from submitting to God's authority. You've got to take all of that off, lay it down, push it away, where you'll never retrieve it again. Number three, you have to make a decision. So number one is submission. Number two, elimination. Number three, decision. You've got to make a decision that you will never veer from what God has said to you, but that you will instead remain committed to the principles of his word. Are you ready for the next one? Number four, continuation. A lot of people start, but they stop. Can't do that. Continuation. Your decision is not a one-time event, but it is an ongoing commitment to continually deny yourself of anything wrong, eliminate wrong thinking, and remain in submission to the Word of God. Dr. Bennett, who trained us for the ministry, he used to say to me, Rick, a lot of people begin with a bang, but they end with a fizzle. Don't end with a fizzle. Begin with a bang and stay there. Continue. Number five, reception. As you walk out the first four steps, you will finally begin to really embrace and receive the Word of God. It'll kick into place in your life. It'll begin to work. And suddenly, that Word that has the power to save you and prolong your life and change you, it'll go into work. But you have to receive it with meekness. It's amazing. And the Bible goes on to say, it has the power to save your souls. Well, guess what? The word power is the Greek word dunamis. The word dunamis is the Greek word that depicts the full might of an advancing army, which means the word that you receive at first, it may seem very uncomfortable. But if you really receive it and let it be engrafted in you, it will release its power. And that word of God in you like an army, will begin to march into all the dark places of your life, drive out the darkness, drive out the poison, liberating you. All of that will happen if you will embrace the Word of God. When you live in submission to God's Word, when you eliminate wrong thinking and believing and decide to obey the Word of God and continue in it, a flood of divine power is released inside you. And by the way, Denise and I are living testimonies of that. Amen, Denise. Amen. And fear is the enemy because fear will, it, it, it's in our flesh. And it says, oh, oh, but what if? But oh, but what if? Oh, but what if? And trusting God, trusting Him, it releases these good things, these truths into our soul where that word start to take a place there in our soul and work there and actually bring change to us. And then that's what we also desperately need is to change. And the word of God, when we, when we say, I trust you, God, then we allow it to come in and, and bring that change. Amen. Hey, if you need prayer, we're here for you. Just write us, prayer at renner.org, or you can call us 1-800-742-5593, and please go to renner.org and download your study guide, which covers everything that we're talking about in home group tonight. But when we come back tomorrow night, we're going to pick up right here, and wow, what we're going to see tomorrow night is going to be shocking to you. There's something in James chapter 1 that you have read and read and read and read and read, but you've never understood it. But tomorrow night, you're going to get it. But hey, we're out of time. Go to bed. We'll see you tomorrow night. If you enjoyed that teaching, please subscribe, like, and comment so more people can see it.